So, but so how I, can a university press go out of business? Because we have an idiot governor who just pulled all their funding. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, no. I actually really want to hear more about this and maybe that could be the first conversation topic, but I'm going to intro everyone. So hi everyone. Uh, hope you're doing well out there. Welcome to another getaway live author event, which is part of Soho Crimes newsletter series that introduces mystery readers just like you to a new series every Tuesday from now through August. Uh, before I pass it over to our wonderful speakers today, I just want to let you know that even if you are muted, you are not silenced. Please feel free to use the chat function to type out any questions you may have or let us know of any conversation topics you'd like to hear more about. Uh, my colleague Alexa and I will be monitoring the chat and filtering the questions to the speakers uh, while they're in conversation. Uh, there might be a more traditional Q&A at the end, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening, Soho Crime Editorial Director, Juliet Grant. Hi everybody, this is such an exciting group. Uh, so many of you here today, it's great to see you. And um, oh, some familiar faces, you've been to this before, you know that these chats are really the highlight of my week. And you also know that you should put your uh, questions in the chat bar because um, things will get very lively. But uh, today I am thrilled to have two of my favorite gents in the world. As it happens, they are both very funny writers, but they're also really funny people. They're just basically the best dinner guests you could ever imagine having at the same table. Um, and, and here we are at this virtual table. So thank you both for joining us. Um, we have Ed Lynn, who is coming to us today from Brooklyn. Is that right, Ed? Oh yeah, Brooklyn in the house. <laughs> Now, uh, now, if you know Ed's Soho, Soho Oof, you know the Taiwan Night Market series, which is an absolutely fantastic, um, offbeat, fun crime series set in Taipei and featuring a young man who owns a, a dumpling stall, basically, who has to get involved in solving crimes for his friends. And it is wonderful and quirky and so full of local color and humor, but you should also know that Ed writes other things for other people too, and they are just as much fun. He writes the Robert Chow series set in 1970s Chinatown, and he also writes literary fiction, um, including his prize-winning debut novel, Way Late. And finally, he's about to dip his toe into a young adult, which I'll let him tell you about later. But Ed is, is um, as his bio says, an all-around stand-up kind of guy. And I'm so excited for you, if you don't know Ed yet, that you're gonna get to know him today, because he's awesome. And equally awesome, but from, I have just learned, five time zones away, it's John Straley coming to us from Alaska. I got it wrong, it's four time zones. Four. <laughs> yeah. Can't keep track of the time zones. John, John Straley is actually one of Soho Crime's first writers. Um, he published his debut novel, The Woman Who Married a Bear With Us, in 1992, and it won the Seamus Award in 1993, and since then, John has written uh, two different series of wonderful, prize-winning, critically acclaimed, often poetic, um, often uh, laugh-out-loud funny uh, crime fiction, mainly set in Alaska, and we are very, very privileged to publish both uh, the Cecil Younger Detective series and also the Cold Storage Alaska kind of crime caper series. Um, John is another all-around stand-up kind of guy, although it does not say <laughs> that in his bio. John, have you considered adding that to your bio? I'm not, I well, I, when I read it in Ed's bio, I thought, God, <laughs> <laughs> That's a good line. I should, I'm going to steal it, but I, mean, I don't know how, how I'm not as stand up, I don't think, as Ed, because uh, I've been reading his books all week and I just got him, I got him in the mail this week and uh, he is a stand up guy. Excellent stuff. I'm just like going wild with him. Oh, you're much too kind. You're much too kind. And <laughs> I, I realized that. You and I both have awful senses of humor, so we'll see. <laughs> we'll see the the guests on this chat uh, eventually dwindle to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I think that should be your challenge. How many people can you drive away by the end? Of the <laughs> well, we'll try to we'll try to work back into telling the people in the uh, that are that tuned in here 
things they might be interested in about. What, what do you think, Julia? Are, are the people that came come to these, are they interested in, what are they interested in? What do you think the people want to know? Well, I think the first thing that they want to know is what, you know, they're here to see you and they want to know the things that you've never told anyone in a book event before. Big letdown. <laughs> you brought this up. So we're starting with you, John. I oh. want you to tell the people the unfiltered story of your life. Okay. Uh, well, my family is marked. There might be family members of my own family here. I don't know, but uh, my family is marked by mental illness, alcoholism, uh, suicide thoughts, and depression. But strangely, by none of my siblings or my parents. Just, just me. Uh, I. I <laughs> have those all cornered in myself. And um, I was born in 1953. Oh, and we moved a lot. Yeah, we moved a lot growing up. I lived in New York City for a time. Uh, but I lived in, uh, let's see, I always made really great career choices. As I grew up, I uh, was very dyslexic. So I wanted to become a writer. <laughs> Perfect. And then uh, my father thought I, I uh, was never going to, you know, uh, have a, any kind of success in life. My siblings were all much, much smarter than I was and much more successful in school than I was. So he suggested that I work with animals and uh, I became a horseshoer in my younger. I always thought, um, Anywhere you go in the world, you could be a horseshoer and you could write poetry. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a horseshoer and a poet. Great, great career choices. And then I moved to Sitka, Alaska. I fell in love with a woman in the Cascade Mountains and she moved to Sitka, Alaska in 1977, which has about 8,000 people. It's on an island and there were no horses on the <laughs> island. Yeah. So uh, I have told that story, but, and so what did I do? I became, I worked on a trail crew for a while. I, I, I built trails, I cut trees, uh, and then I became a private investigator for a young lawyer who graduated from Harvard Law School when he was 18. And we traveled all around Alaska trying serious felony cases, and I became his uh, investigator. And I ended up doing that for the Public Defender Agency and other places for about 30 years, uh, working as an investigator. And, uh, and I had written, I had written poetry and I had written a, a contemporary Western novel. I had written other things. But then I thought, well, I should try writing a crime novel. I should try writing a mystery. And it was all just luck, happenstance, that my first book started making the rounds. I had gotten so many rejection letters that I just said, well, I'm going to just write until I just know it's ready. I don't care if I'm, you know, obese and insane and uh, living in a basement without windows and just clacking away on a computer, you know, just... No one understands me. No one understands me. I, you know, the, the nightmare of everyone who wants to try to write. I just said, oh, I don't care. And uh, that's my basic um, uh, attitude about writing to this day is just, I don't really, I don't really give a fuck. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, other children just, on this call. Oh, sorry. <laughs> about success or failure. I mean, I, I, I do want to please Juliet and I want to please. That's all you should. That's yes. All that I want to please the fine people. And I love going to the, I love being with Soho Press because, I, and I, I don't mean this to sound really too much of a suck up, but and you go to these conferences and Soho Press is all the cool kids are at the Soho press table. All of the 
all of the people that I would naturally gravitate towards um, are all at Soho Press and at their around their tables and stuff. And those are the people I want to would want to talk to. All of the different voices, and I'm just crazy about about that. So, uh, but other than that, you know, the uh, being a writer, being successful, having it fit in a certain genre, having it have them them fit a certain model. I just never cared much about that. I just always wanted to write sort of about the music of the, the place that I live. And that's, well, I guess. That's one of the things that's so cool about your books is for you, you're not taking chances. You're just, you're doing what you want to do. You don't, you have, you have no um, obligation toward the form or the conventions that other people feel hemmed in by. And that's why what we get from you is it's like poetry and it's so creative and it's so brain breaking and wonderful. And, uh, and I think it's really, um, it's a really special thing. It's an unusual kind of crime fiction writing. Um, but actually, I, I do want to press you on one little point here. Per a question that has come up from our audience, we'd like to know a little bit more about those private investigator experiences and if there were any really interesting ones that ended up informing your, your crime writing. Oh, yeah. I mean, everything I did informs the crime writing in that... Um, well, in Alaska, well, how, how should I put this? Real crime in the world is unbearably sad. Yeah. You know? <laughs> when you're worrying it with real crime, and it is not much at all like crime fiction in that there isn't that, that um, there isn't any fun in the chase. You know, and because it's just overwhelmingly uh, filled with grief. Uh, um, somebody's been killed and their family members are just filled with grief. And, and a lot of writers get that right. I love the, in, 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 in I'm reading Ed's first book and, you know, he knows the, the victim, the, the storyteller, the narrator knows the victim in the in the first thing, and he gets that grief really well. But also the, you know, how some people like to try to boil stories down to maybe one or two or seven. I've heard all kinds of numbers that there's essentially one or two stories. Really, crime boils down to, you know, really pathetically few motivations, and it's lack of impulse control by men mostly and it's it's enhanced by drugs and alcohol and uh and that's pretty much it for real crime but uh there are cases the the great fun thing about working in real crime is meeting people you wouldn't ordinarily meet at all you know and who turn out to be remarkably funny and wild just wild <laughs> that you wouldn't meet in under any ordinary circumstances. People, you know, a guy that broke, you know, a guy in Ketchikan that I was working for who broke somebody's jaw. And it, this was the third time he broke somebody's jaw and in a bar. And he, it was a felony because he broke it seriously. And, you know, no, nobody understands how easily faces break when you get punched. And, this was, he was, he was looking at like 30 years in jail for breaking this guy's face. And, but the rules of the bar he was in, this is the Marine bar, was that if you wear a hat behind the bar, like if you sneak behind the bar while you're wearing your ball cap, you have to buy everyone around. That's just the rules of the house. And so some out of towner in Ketchikan, some, asshole from Seattle probably went behind the bar and he refused to buy around. So my guy was just indignant with the with how unfair this was, so he punched him. And he thought this was his absolutely ironclad legal defense. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he wanted that presented in court, you know, and that and he wanted me to track it down and you know I was his investigator. 
And so, you know, I had to, I, because I wanted him to trust me, I sort of checked into this. And of course the lawyer said, you know, this is not a legal defense under any circumstance. You don't get to break someone's jaw and the occipital lobe of his eyeball because he wore his hat behind the bar. But it's, this guy was just gobsmacked that, that, that the world could be so unfair as to, as to, uh, you know, not understand that. John, but there were thousands of cases that I've worked on, and each one I worked on a, on a homicide, nine counts of homicide, one of, no, eight counts of homicide, and one of an arson. I worked on that one case for a year. Uh, and uh, I, I believe that the kid who was accused, he was a young guy at the time, was not guilty, and, and he was found not guilty of a multiple homicide. And, you know, I thought that that was a good result. Yeah, worthy. Yeah. Uh, so one of the most memorable things anyone has ever said to me about crime fiction or crime is, it's you, obviously. And it was, we were working on, um, on Baby's First Felony, which is a wonderful book. Everyone should definitely read it. But, uh, <laughs> but you said, there is no such thing as a criminal mastermind. <laughs> I well, there might be. I've just never, never oh. gotten close to one. Yeah, I, which I think is, it's really the, that shade of reality that you bring into your storytelling where you're finding entertaining and uh, surprising stories without ever using the narrative tricks of, you know, of fiction or of the genre form. It's, you know, it's really excellent. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. uh, Ed, I'm going to, I'm going to put you on the spot now. Okay. Here, we want to hear the story of your life as you've never told it before. We want family secrets. We want, uh, yeah, go, go for it. <laughs> family secrets. Uh, In fact, oh. specifically, Beth asks um, for either of you, but we're going to start with Ed. Have either of you ever engaged in the criminal life in order to write about it so well? The criminal life. Huh. What does the criminal life mean? <laughs> Have we ever broken the law, you mean? We can, we can come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I, I just want to talk about something that just came to mind because you just uh, talked about criminal masterminds and how there are none. And I was thinking that there are criminal masterminds, but these guys operate within the field, uh, what is, is deeded as legal. And right. they're working at like hedge funds and other international finance groups, just, you know, keeping stuff legal and tax sheltering properly and stuff. And they're doing great. <laughs> you know, this is no like, oh, let's get high and steal a car kind of thing. This is like the real mastermind kind of thing. I agree with that, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Well, I, I moved around a lot uh, when I was a kid. I was born in Queens uh, in Howard Beach near JFK. And so, like, that whole, the whole sound of planes landing and taking off is, is very deep. Uh, within my uh, my subconscious, uh, sometimes when I'm asleep and dreaming, I can still kind of hear them. Uh, I grew up in a couple different places in Jersey, uh, eventually made it to Pennsylvania, uh, came back to, to the tri-state area to go to college at Columbia. Uh, I wanted to be in New York City because, you know, I was going to start this, you know, velvet underground, like, you know, group and just like kind of destroy the world with, with our, our music. But uh, even though I was in a number of bands, uh, that never happened. Uh, somehow, uh, it, I, I kind of feel like to be a really, really good band, it can't be a meritocracy. There has to be like some, someone who's willing to be the dictator and just like, this is what we're going to do. And everyone else has to fall in line. And uh, I, I couldn't be the dictator or someone else who fell in line. And so uh, that's kind of where my musical ambition went to the wayside. But I've always wanted to be a writer. I mean, I've always wanted to write um, yeah, ever since I learned how to write. Uh, I was writing poems in elementary school, like first and second grade. Our, our 
my my school in Jersey had this literary journal. <laughs> I'm sure all the teachers just, you know, wanted to die putting this thing together. But uh, I have a couple of poems in there. And every once in a while, my wife will just quote one of them and just destroy me. Um, <laughs> I, I love your wife. She's great. She's awesome. <laughs> she, is, she is like the best person in the world. She really is. <laughs> She's incredible. Um, let's you see. Actually. Literary journals. Though. That was a, that was tough. You know. John, I have a question for you. I knew this guy in college, uh, last name was Robertson, and his, he grew up in rural Alaska, a uh, single dad, and his, his dad was uh, also a, a private investigator. And his, his dad had nabbed this guy who had been dealing drugs, but then found out that, you know, quite a ways away that they, were hot on the trail of a murderer. And so he told the, the druggie, he was like, look, you gotta stay here, take care of my kid, you know, um, cook meals for him, you know, get him dressed uh, every, every day and everything. Cause if you don't, when I come back, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> and so, you know, this Robertson, drug huh? dealer was taking care of my friend for like a week until his dad came back. <laughs> Nice. Do you know, remember, was it up in Anchorage? I don't know. It was a small, really small town. I, I can't remember the name of it, but. Um, Robertson. Huh. I yeah. Don't, don't Robertson, look at it. yeah. Huh. Doesn't, it, it, it's not surprising. I mean, that, that uh, a private eye would have a friend who was a drug dealer and would trust to, <laughs> take, to take care of his kid. That's not surprising. I, uh, you asked if, if I had ever really broken the law. There was one time I had the instinct. It's kind of like that urge to do it. And it was a client uh, of ours had been hauled in on a murder case. And he had, been, we had, he had known that it was coming. And his lawyer had said, you had better start saving a lot of bail money. And it had to be cash. So you better put it, put a lot of it in. And uh, so his lawyer called me and said, all right, this guy is gonna get hauled up, hauled in. I want you to sit with him outside of the jail. It wasn't really a jail, but I, I don't wanna be too specific about some of the details here. And, uh, and uh, just make sure he doesn't talk to the cops. It was my brief, my instruction, make sure he doesn't talk anymore. And uh, so I went in, I went in and I sat with him and he said, oh, forget about me. I just want to make sure my wife is okay and my child is okay. And I said, all right. And then the wife and child came in and uh, said, uh, I, I, uh, I'm trying to get the bail money, but I can't unlock the safe. And so they wouldn't let her in to see him. So I went in and asked him for the combination to his safe. He wrote it down, he gave it to me. I went out to give it to her and she came back, said, I still can't get it open. And then he told me all the tricks to open his safe. And he had about $700,000 in cash <laughs> in, in this safe. And uh, she, she just couldn't get it open. And I just sat there watching and he, he wasn't going to get out of jail. This guy wasn't going to get out of jail for a while, but I sat and thought long and hard about nobody likes this guy and nobody's, nobody knows how much money he saved. I could take, I could take $500,000 out of his safe and I could just bury it. I could just bury it and I could, you know, out behind my house in a plastic and not touch it for, until my son is ready to go to college. And uh, that was the only time I, and then I realized that he would kill me uh, as soon as he got out and saw that it was missing and that the wife would probably kill me and, and his children would probably help him bury me. But um, it was the only time I ever thought, yeah, I could do this. You know, I could, like my, all of our clients, you know, like, yeah, I could do this. And I, I might get away with it, you know, and I could just bury it and nobody's gonna 
you know, none of the police are going to go to work, go to bat for this guy. The police aren't going to go to bat for this guy because he's the most hated man ever because he was accused of killing three people and innocents. And, uh, and I, that was my only time I ever had that sort of criminal instinct where I thought, oh, maybe I could do it. But you follow that instinct and it always ends in grief. Yeah. <laughs> you, were, you were smart enough to know that you weren't smart enough to get away with it. Whereas, yeah. what about you, Ed? Anything you want to get off your chest today? I, okay. Um, well, okay. I have never said this before. Oh, um, nice. <laughs> well, well to, to anyone outside of my house. It's, it's really weak. It's really weak. But um, do, did you guys in elementary school read this book called The Pig Man? No. Okay, it's it's like you know a typical young adult book um, where these kids they uh, they have this game where they they dial numbers at random and try to keep whoever answers the phone try to keep them on the line as long as possible and you, you, the winner is whoever keeps someone on on the phone as long as possible. So after reading that, I started crank call people trying to keep them on the phone as long as possible um the, the most successful uh pitch was hey i'm calling from your favorite radio station if you tell me what your favorite radio station is and it's ours you're gonna win a thousand dollars and like people would stay on and like try to guess and everything and the goal was just to keep them on the line just to keep them on <laughs> you should have been a telemarketer. I actually, I worked for <laughs> Columbia's, um, they had this thing called uh, Telefund, uh, where you call up alums and try to guilt them into giving money. And I was especially good with the so-called non-donors, people who had never given money. I was really good. What's the worst job you ever had? The worst job I ever had was also the best job I ever had in the sense that I was, <laughs> I was working in this warehouse um, in, in like November and December. Like they were trying to get all these Christmas, you know, gifts, you know, properly shipped and everything. Uh, and even though it was November, December and freezing outside, it was hot as hell in this place. Uh, but the best thing about it was that I, my coworker was a Vietnam vet and I got to talking to him a lot. And we spent, you know, 18 hours a day together. Uh, and that helped inform some of my writing and some of my books. So um, it was horrible in the short term, but really great long term. Still paying dividends. Still. Hey, you actually haven't told us, can, can you go back to that patch about how you started writing? Like what was, you, did, you actually didn't tell the people here what you were trained in at college or about your transfer to your uh, very related career now. Oh, um, well, I, I majored in mining engineering. Um, that major has since been PC'd into earth and environmental engineering. But still a lot of the same principles uh, are in it. Uh, my senior project was an open pit gold mine. Um, you know, horrible for the environment. You have all these heap leaches, chemicals going into drinking water, you know, unsavory things like that. Um, but while I was still an undergrad, I was like, I, I, I saw my ultimate goal right there because, you know, right on campus is like the Columbia Journalism School too. And so, well, like, I had already been, like, reading up on all the bulletins and everything. Um, so, eventually, I got into the journalism school. I took the in, you know, you have to actually go in and take the test right there. Um, and uh, I, my day job is editing financial news. Ta-da! Wow. 
Okay, but actually, and this is a specific question from an audience member, can you tell us a little bit how you got started in publishing? You are a, a groundbreaking uh, Asian American writer. You're the first winner of three um, uh, Asian American literary prizes, for example, and uh, another, like John Straley, another author who really doesn't pay any care, uh, heat of mind to conventions or to uh, structures and genre and who really does his own thing. Another reason I'm so excited to, to publish your stuff, Ed. But can you tell us a little bit, was it difficult in the beginning? Um, how was your, your debut process? What, what was it like for you? Oh, uh, it, was, it was very fraught. <laughs> because like I'm a, you know, even if I tried to be like really conventional and like by the book, I just, there's just something in me and like a, like a, a funny gene that has to go through and just flip flops. And I just, I just kind of can't really toe the line. I, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I got really good grades, but I'm a terrible student. I can't sit and like, listen to people lecture I just I, you know I just can't I would always like learn by by doing the actual problems or reading the books um and like I feel like my writing is kind of like the same it's almost like it, it's it's like a unique musical instrument that only I know how to play and uh I guess it's a bit like jazz in that I'm I'm trying to do something different each time uh, instead of rather getting like a song down, uh, you know, four by four bars. I'm just trying, I don't know. It's, I'm sick. I'm basically just saying that. I'm sick and writing makes me feel great. That is the best description of the calling. <laughs> Who do you like to read? I mean, when I was reading uh, the um, your first book, I I felt like uh, uh, I could feel the ghosts of some classic mystery writers. Um, you know, I, um, by page eight, I thought you had just jumped right into a story. I mean, you're not. It's not just all accidental. I mean, uh, you must have read some of these, some of these uh, crime writers, or had I, you? I'm going to throw out a name, and I'm pretty sure that you're a pretty big fan too, Charles Williford. Yes. Yes, I knew it. Uh, I know Charles. I knew Williford it. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah, huge fan. Huge, oh, huge, yeah, yeah. Huge Charles Williford fan. <laughs> <laughs> and I cannot believe uh, the burnt orange heresy is has apparently been filmed or is in the process of filming uh, with Mick uh, Jagger in it. Really? Yeah. Uh, for those uh, on the call who are not familiar with Charles Williford, he's a guy who, um, you know, he he went into the military. Uh, he was orphaned pretty early on in life. Um, and he's written two different memoirs, one of them about the time when he was an orphan, another about his time in the military. And one of the things he said is that if you want to write, you should join the army. He's got plenty of time to sit down and write. Um, so he was getting stuff published in these small pulps and like fly by night, little newsstand uh, edition sort of things uh, for years. and. His his earlier books are just in and out of print on um, different presses. Uh, it, it's good to get them while they're in print. Uh, but then he hit it big with Miami Blues late in life. Uh, huge hit, became a movie and everything. And he tried to kill his career right there by writing the sequel in which the the protagonist goes out and shoots his kids. Oh, <laughs> to get a, a peace right. of mind, but that, of course, you know, his agent like killed that, and he wrote three more books um, in the Hoke Mosley series, uh, and then he he became he got a million dollar advance or something like that, and then shortly after he dies, so that it's kind of like one of his own stories. You know, this guy yeah. kind of toiling at writing, and then he hits it, and then he's gone. <laughs> Didn't yeah survive? Yeah, he really celebrated absurdity. And uh, 
his books all have this like verb to them that's uh really great yeah well do you you i was curious you said you were born in the united states mm -hmm. well how long did you spend in taiwan um i have never been in taiwan longer than like two and a half weeks really but i feel like i've been living with it because uh like my parents are like they kind of represent like the major populations of Taiwan. My father is a long time. His family came over to Taiwan when the Ming Dynasty collapsed, uh, you know, in the 1600s. And my mother's family uh, arrived in Taiwan uh, when the uh, you know the Guomindang lost the Civil War. So. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just feel like it's always been in the house, you know, growing up with it, uh, you know, the state of affairs of Taiwan and China. Uh, and then when martial law was finally lifted, <laughs> then my father felt that he had the voice. He, he could bring his, raise his voice to say, Taiwan must be free. Taiwan must be independent. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, when did this start? But uh, that, that became one of his things. Um, so I kind of, we would go there like every couple of years, um, you know, but before going, I remember my mother would get like this huge, huge uh, mailer box and like, you know, buy those one pound Hershey chocolate bars and all this nice stuff. And I was, I'd be like, what the hell's going on? You don't even buy this for us. And she's like, this is for our relatives. Like <laughs> all this nice stuff going to Taiwan. <laughs> Yeah. Amazing. Well, what do you think, what, uh, what's happening in Taiwan today under Trump? What's, what's happening now? Because all we hear about is Hong Kong. Yes, yes. Uh, I understand that there is some legislative support for Hong Kongers to move to Taiwan. Um, I mean, I feel like, you know, China has just been punching it Taiwan so long it's like you know in shape to like really give it to Hong Kong you know because mm -hmm. they're they are doing to Hong Kong exactly what they want to do to uh, Taiwan I mean just today uh, China announced that they are jailing four students in Hong Kong for uh, talking about Hong Kong independence on social media and they've been doing that in Taiwan forever right Oh, uh, they, they want to do that to Taiwan. I mean, Taiwan, uh, under martial law, Taiwan was like a, another kind of like almost communist in the way it was run by a single party for many years. But um, mm -hmm. in the last 20 years or so, Taiwan is like a pretty full-blown democracy. Like even the communist party is allowed to, to, to be in Taiwan and run for election. Yeah. It's such a neat thing. Go Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I'm just curious, more curious about Taiwan. Well, it is. It's it's a fascinating place, and the history is is so sort of analogous to American history, which was one of the reasons I was originally so drawn to um, to Ed's first book, uh, Ghost Month, because it it really um, I think. Taiwan is a great foil for the United States. It had these two waves of colonialism that kind of match ours. And um, it's a place that a lot of Americans, we don't quite understand the relationship with China, you know, which um, are they one country or two is the big question, which Ed probably has a very complex answer to. But I love that his stories really focus on the people um, and the food, so much good yeah. food and, and they use the, this cast of characters who each sort of represent a microcosm of, of the Taiwanese population. And it shows the history and the politics and the conversation it really enriches it for readers who don't know a ton. I don't want to put words in your mouth though, Ed, but- No, oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Very kind, Julia. No, it's, it's I, I love Taiwan. It's, uh, it's actually Ed and I, that's how we started talking about doing this series is because we were both talking about how much we love Taiwan and there's not a ton of literature in English about Taiwan. So you should definitely check out Ghost Month. It's a really good starting point. But, um, but gents, I actually have to open up um, to audience questions very soon. However, 
uh, I didn't get through any of my questions I was going to pose to you because you all are so good at, at running this yourself. I do want to ask you quickly, we'll have two quick lightning rounds before I open it up to the crowd. First, as you're looking at your, your long and brilliant multi, multi, colored careers. Is there a book in your backlist that you would like the people today uh, to know about? Maybe it doesn't have to be a Soho book, obviously, but, um, but tell us a little bit about a book that you're still so proud of that you still think about. And you get to go first. Oh my gosh, I think about all of them, Juliet. I feel I like I'm, feel I'm like haunted by them. They are all my children. How can I like one more than any other? No, they too. all resemble me. I got to put them all through college too. Um, but uh, I would have to say that, you know, in, in terms of like uh, political currents and, and China, I mean, Ghost Month really has been on my mind a lot. Um, because if I wrote it now, it would be much, not much different, maybe, but uh, substantially, uh, there would be a, a number of things. Just, just the, it's amazing just how like there's no, there doesn't seem to be any political calm around Taiwan. It's always pretty turbulent, as turbulent as the Taiwan Strait. Nice. Um, well, you know, I have two series, the Cecil Younger series and then the cold storage series. Um, I think in the, the Cecil series, I really still like the curious eat themselves which is my second book. Uh, and it, it doesn't get talked about as much as The Woman Who Married a Bear and, and, and the newer ones. But I, I always have a soft spot for the curious eat themselves. I, I was working for the public defender when I wrote it. I, um, and I was, I was spending a lot of time in a bookstore in Ketchikan. Um, and uh, a wonderful, uh, old woman, she's gone now, Miss Vivian, Miss Vivian, oh God. She ran the, this place and she was from Eastern Europe and she would give me, uh, we, she introduced me to Shezwa Miwash and also um, James Wright and uh, different poets and we would talk about poetry and um, and I, through in one of James Wright's poems is about fishing a woman's body out of the water, and I uh, and her bookstore was sat on this estuary in, in Ketchikan, which is a high crime town. Ketchikan is a great town for crime, and because <laughs> it's a rough town and. And it's a transient labor town and people love to talk about crime. You know, that's the best thing for an investigator is to go, you can knock on a door and say, you know, yeah, I'm here to talk about some horrible, nasty, ugly sex crime or something. And they'll say, oh yeah, come on in. And they'll just, they'll love to talk about it. They'll pour you a cup of coffee and they'll tell you what you know, they're great witnesses. Can't, Sitka is a little more prissy about stuff like that. Uh, oh, no, we don't want to talk about that horrible stuff, but Ketchikan is rough, you know. And anyway, <coughs> this um, Lillian, Miss Lillian, sorry, she, and she ran this bookstore, and we would sit and drink coffee and tea and stuff, and, <coughs> and from that, from her suggestion of getting James Wright's poetry and uh, hauling the the body, the woman's body out of the muddy river. I started that book. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I spent a lot of time in Ketchikan that year. And, uh, and I thought, and, and when I turned it into Yuri Yuryevich, who was the editor who handled it there at Soho, and he was very, very old school. And he, um, he used a typewriter and a pair of scissors to, to, to revise it. And he just cut it up completely and reordered it. He, we, he sliced my manuscript up with, with scissors 
and retaped it, reordered it, taped it back together, and had handwritten new areas, you know, to revi help me revise it. He just I've seen some of his edits that are in the old file. They're incredible. <laughs> Yeah. I don't even know how his brain could have worked like that. <laughs> I know. It, I, I think he just. I think he just spread it out on a huge floor and then just re-edited it and cut it apart with scissors, taped it together, and uh, it was it was fascinating. Of course, my tender little feelers were hurt when he when I first saw it, but it became one of my more favorite learning experiences, and and also um, I. By the time I finished it, I was working as an environmental crimes investigator. I, I carried a badge for a while, and I was up in the Arctic investigating environmental crimes. This was me, John Straley, not, not Cecil. But I was working, my wife was finishing graduate school in Fairbanks, and I, I just got a gig. I had already done the Exxon Valdez defense case. <clears throat> and after that, they hired me as an environmental crimes investigator. And so I traveled all over and I was crawling around the North Slope in the Arctic. And then so I combined those two experiences. And uh, I think there's a lot of, I had a lot of fun writing it. And I, and I learned a lot. And so I have a, and there's some extraordinary places that I visited there in that book. So the the curious eat themselves, I have a warm spot for. Bronwyn would like you to know, Bronwyn, our illustrious publisher, that she too has had the experience of having her manuscripts cut apart and taped back together by Yuri Yurevich, so. <laughs> um, nice. it's, it's, how, it's how he worked. I wish I could have seen inside his brain. It would have been a great lesson to me in, in how to edit. But, he could have been rugged. Uh, he, he could be rugged too, boy. Uh, yeah, so can I. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're tough. Yeah, I'm tough, right? You're, I'm tough. Yeah, yeah, you're tough. <laughs> he once he once said that uh, he once said though that if my agent got in the way of his paperback deals for the Curious Eat themselves, he was gonna cut off his head and piss down his throat. Ah, that was tough. I don't know if I would have chosen those same words. <laughs> I, mean, I would have phrased it differently. <laughs> I was a little shocked Maybe too. You're I didn't know what to do. You know, I didn't know. I said, "Well, you know, my agent is going to do what he's going to do," and I know. Yeah. Uh, well, I have another lightning round for you guys, uh, which is just quickly: uh, Have you read anything recently that you want to recommend to all of our friends? Go ahead, Ed, because mine is going to be obvious. Okay. We can come oh, back man. to it. We can I can't. No, I can't remember the title, uh, but uh, there's this collection that uh, Columbia University's Press uh, came out with, um, and it, it's a collection of uh, crimes and deception in uh, Ming Dynasty China, Amazing. and it's it's so funny because you know when these when you know the victims of the crime, the people who got swindled out of their silk or gold or whatever you know you, you think your neighbors would come around and try to comfort you or try to help find the thieves but instead when, when your neighbors come out they gather to laugh at you and what a fool you are you will have uh, to find the title of it and send it to steven afterwards so that when he does his follow-up to everyone yeah okay okay sure okay um, see i um uh, well of course i'm reading this right now Oh, shucks. Yeah, and I love this. And uh, I'm also reading this, uh, My Beautiful Friend, My Brilliant Friend by uh, Elena Ferrante. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, my son sent me this. My son, our son, Finn Straley. Um, do you like this one? Yeah. Uh, do you that? Yeah. I'm addict. Yeah. yeah, I and I don't uh, and I really enjoy that. I also this is just was well, shit. My wife just published this. Uh, Ed Ricketts from Cannery Road to Sitka, Alaska. So I should like that. So for oh. the call, John's wife is also really cool. I hate to do this because it's pretty sexist, but both of these gentlemen have married really well, and their wives are both like 
literally rock star, not literally rock stars, but Jan is a marine biologist and she's so, so cool. And Cindy is literally a movie star and she's really cool. So, you know, well there done. You know. Well done in marriage, gentlemen. <laughs> uh, it's my retirement plan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And this, this book is called Ed Ricketts from Cannery Road to Sitka, Alaska. And uh, it's about um, when Ed Ricketts, Joseph Campbell, J Jack Calvin, and his wife took a small boat from Seattle to Tacoma in 1932. And then uh, the research they did up here and uh, the stories of John Steinbeck and their, all their uh, interaction in Southeastern Alaska. So well, it. we're gonna let everybody who, is, who gets the newsletter is gonna get these titles pushed to them in, in the email. So thank you both. I, we learned something today and we would never would have encountered it otherwise. Oh, thanks, Alexa. Alexa's popped it into the chat bubble as well. Okay, so we have a couple audience questions. First, the famous one. Are you a plotter or a pantser? Or a pantser? Yeah. Like pantsing people? <laughs> Wait, pantser? So, really? Oh. So, so the question is, gentlemen, do you plot your mysteries and ants or do you start writing them and see what happens? The plotters are the, are the ones who plot and the pantsers are the ones who write by the seat of their pants. Oh. <laughs> well, it's, you know, possible but not up for this specific conversation. Oh. Well, I used to be more of a pantser, but I'm becoming a lot more of a plotter. Ooh, I'm, can be I'm starting to, this is my, I have a three by five card index for, um, this is what I did for uh, three by five cards for the book I just, manuscript I just sent to So. The book is called So Far and Good, and I wrote So Far and Good on the box. And, uh, and I wrote the epigraph for the book on the back in gold ink. And then uh, the different colored uh, cards have different elements in the story. That's beautiful. John, I love that. That, oh, I. And so, uh, and then, but then do I follow it 100% as far as the plot goes? Mm, I'd like to say I do, but not really. What I do is I, I write the plot elements and I, I use it for consistency with with the characters, I write the characters and I write, you know, the things that have to happen. What I do it for is to make sure that uh, things happen in the book uh, more frequently than, than a lot of my just ruminating. When I, when I write by the seat of my pants, I have a lot more ruminating than I would like. And so this helps me keep it moving. What about you, Ed? You know, I'm definitely both. I'm a, a planter because I kind of, I kind of know, I know what's going to happen. And, uh, there's a lot of stuff I don't know. So like, I, I usually try to write linear. And then when I get about 75% of the way, I start at what, what I think is going to be the end or start going backwards. And so like they, you know, meet about 75% of the way through. Do you, uh, do you have a, an index card box or another visual tool like John has? I don't, but I'm a very sensory kind of person. And I really, I, I feel like uh, the newer Apple laptops have, have lost something. So I, I usually write um, on older laptops, like a, a G4. Like my, my favorite machine is the 12-inch PowerBook G4 because um, it's just so compact and the, the keys just feel great and I just love that. Uh, gentlemen, we are just about out of time. Um, there is an amazing comment stream with all kinds of people weighing in on um, the, your books and your settings. And I'll Oh, oh the, the Book of Swindles. That's the title of the, the Ming Dynasty book, Book of Swindles. Yeah, we're all going to have Thank you, Nita. Sounds oh, like, yeah. Sounds like some great fodder for future crime patients. Oh, sorry. Tell us, tell, uh, tell the people about your most recent books. John, 
because yeah, here's here's your pitch. I didn't do this. I'm so sorry. Let's hear about uh, what's time to a pig. And Ed, let's hear about David Tung. <laughs> Ed, you go. First. Tell them. Tell them about it. What is time to a pig is uh, set in the near future in a prison, off built off southeastern Alaska, uh, and the main character is a young man named Gloomy Knob, who is having uh, enhanced interrogation techniques applied to him to find out where he hid a thermonuclear device. The problem is he 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 literally doesn't know uh, he where the device is and so they keep they just keep bumping these random memories out of him and uh it, it, the book has this sort of floaty consciousness uh coming out of poor gloomy and eventually uh, he break he's broken out of prison and he uh they uh, figure out and another uh, of the inmates leads them to this thermonuclear device. It's in the, it's in the, um, it's in the um, Cold Storage Alaska series. The one I just finished is a Cecil Younger book. And that I'm, and I just sent that off to New York yesterday. It is really awesome. What is time to a pig? Everyone should get it. Make sure that you're read up on cold storage so you're ready for Cecil Younger next year. So, Ed, tell us about your venture. Oh, uh, I have a YA book coming out uh, at the end of September. Uh, and it, it's kind of poignant for me because it's coming out on Kaya, which published my first book, Waylaid, almost two decades ago. Uh, the book is called David Tung Can't Have a Girlfriend Until He Gets Into an Ivy League College. Good, and I feel... <laughs> I feel like this will resonate with a certain uh, demographic of the Asian American diaspora. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and I, it, it is painful, but it's really funny too. I wanted to find the humor in the pain and maybe uh, alleviate some, some of that pain that younger people are feeling now from the viewpoint of someone who has been through it and is looking back upon it many decades later. I'm very excited. What's the pub date? Uh, late September. Okay, okay September. Uh, well, thank you both. I am going to close out now and turn it over to my colleague, Stephen. Um, but for, before I do, thank you both for being here. I love talking to you. I hope we can do this again sometime or maybe even in the same room. But, uh, but thanks for being so awesome today. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank okay, you, man. Great. Cool kids at Soho. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys, um, all of you, John and Ed. This is maybe the funniest getaway event that we've had, definitely. Um, and and Juliet, thank you always for moderating and, and, and being awesome. And thank you all of you guys out there for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. Please expect a follow-up email with uh, some links to the books that we talked about today and also the next newsletter, which will have a, a new series that we'll be introducing to you guys. So. See you soon. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. See, you, Ed. <laughs> I'll see you, John. See you, Juliet. <laughs> see you, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs>